Good afternoon. This is Professor Dunham, and I'm doing a weekly review. This week, we'll be concentrating on Chapter 6. That is the nursing care of the mother and infant during labor and birth. Okay, I'm going to share my screen so that you can see the PowerPoints as you listen and see the video. Okay, here we go. Okay. So again, this is chap this is week five, chapter six. And we're gonna st start by talking a little bit about culture influences. This is important because you'll probably see a question on, on an exam and Hesse would probably have a question on this because we have to know that the role of a woman in labor is, you know, it was quite unique, okay? And they do have some cultural preferences. And this does require a lot of flexibility, folks. And so, you know, she has a certain, you know, type of um, rituals that she wants to follow. It's okay. We have to be very diverse and never judgmental. The role of the father and the partner in labor and delivery could be could be different than what we maybe we we think we expect from our norm. But again, a lot of this is driven by cultural practices. So it would be good to know. And on page one twenty three in your book, you have birth practices of selected cultural groups, and that's table point six point one. Okay. So here's a little brain teaser for you. So which of the following nursing actions demonstrates cultural sensitivity in the care of the laboring woman? Well, there you go. So it's not culture sensitivity, is insensitivity. So you must read these questions very carefully. So what would you say? Well, it would be B. You insist the mother remove her head covering. Yeah, again, cultural insensitivity. All right. Settings for childbirth, there's three different settings. You have hospital, you have freestanding birth centers, and you have home. They all have their advantages and disadvantages. Uh, the only one I really, uh, really like is the hospital setting because I do come from a hospital-based practice. And so why? Why do I like the hospitals? Because if something goes wrong, okay, um, I have the support I have anesthesia there, I have surgeons there, I have other um, nursing personnel there. So we can intervene very, very quickly. And sometimes these emergencies have to be intervened so quickly in order to save mom and to save baby. Okay, so these are the now the four Ps, and sometimes I refer to them as the five Ps, but these are the four Ps of the labor and birth process. All these, the powers, the passageway, the passenger and the psych, they all work together in order to get our baby out. Okay, and we have some other factors too. Now those factors I went over, the four Ps, they all, all have influence on how labor and birth process goes. So you have to have contractions um, in order to dilate into the face of cervix. You have to have contractions to help push that baby down when it comes to when she's 10 centimeters. Um, the passageway has to be a really good pelvis, such as my, the gynecoid pelvis is the most favorable for vaginal delivery. And the platytoid is the most unfavorable one because it's flat. It's a flat and pelvis. Now the passenger, he's got to, he or she's got to um, go with the program here and follow the passageway down and not to be too big and to have the head in a OA position. That's occipital anterior. That's where the head is down and nicely tucked down. And that means the occipital, the back portion of the baby's head is to mom's interior. That's occipital anterior. And then you have the psychic. We always talk about the psychic and, and maternity because it is so important. Um, she needs to have support. It does help the emotional status. Okay, moving along, uterine contractions. Again, they're the power. We need them. We need the effect of the contraction on the cervix, dilation and effacement. And part of a contraction, there's three phases. You have the increment. Then you have, as you get to the top portion of the contraction, it's called a peak or acne. And then you have, as they come down, it has a decrement.
these are all part and we they're like little hills and in your book you have a really nice picture on page 127 of the contraction okay and then frequency okay frequency is how often are they coming and normally frequency could be from anywhere from two to three minutes apart which is great um, in early, early labor, they're more spread out. And, and she's in false labor, they're, they're really very erratic. They're maybe five, seven, 10 minutes apart. But when she's in true labor, we like the contractions to be every two to three minutes. That's frequency. Okay, then the duration. Duration is the time between the beginning of one contraction to the end of the contraction. So it's just one contraction. Okay, so again, duration is how long um, they're last, um, how long they're lasting. So duration, the time between the beginning of the contraction to the end of the contraction. Okay, so that's duration. And then intensity. Um, you have mild, moderate, and firm. And like I always taught my new nurses, touch your nose, and that is a mild contraction. So if you're sitting at home, go ahead and touch your nose. And then if it's moderate, it would be your chin. So if you can feel a difference. And then a really firm contraction is the forehead. And then you have, of course, we get to completely dilated. And now we need those contractions to help push that baby down and out. And so we push only during a contraction. So again, all the contractions are so, so important um, for the labor birth process. Another contraction that these are regular irregular contractions, these are called Brass and Hicks. And they do begin in early pregnancy, and we don't like them in early pregnancy, um, but they do, they can be there and they can intensify as a woman gets more full term. And they can be annoying too, because Brass and Hicks, um, they don't really do too much. There's there's some research on this, but right now, Brass and Hicks, irregular contractions. And always remember safety alerts. If you're if you are an LPN and you're in the labor room and you have a patient that you do see that a contraction is occurring very frequently, so they're more than like um, every two minutes and they're lasting longer than 90 seconds, please go and get someone. Go ahead and tell the RN and that she can come in and do some interventions. Um, so this is about cervical effacement and dilation. Okay, so cervical effacement is how thin the cervix is actually becoming. Okay, so um, I, I say if you ever suck on a lifesaver, you know how you, you're sucking on a lifesaver and as the candy becomes thinner, they actually, the center of the opening actually becomes wider, right? And then it breaks it up in your mouth. But that's basically what effacement is all about. And this is a dilation chart that shows you that. Um, you can see up in the upper left here, you can see this is one centimeter and you can see how thick the cervix is. And as the, and as your patient dilates, um, it becomes thinner. See how this occurs? Okay. So this is a chart that we actually use for new nurses to learn because everything is done by feel in the labor room when you do a vag exam. So you can't see you can't see the cervix. You can just feel the cervix with your fingers. And these are the two fingers that are used. Okay, and we use a sterile glove. Okay, so here, this comes right out of your book. This is the contraction cycle that I was talking about. And so here, again, um, as the contraction goes up, it's called the increment. On the peak of the contraction, which is the top, this is where the most powerful portion of the um, contraction is. And then this here is the decretment as it does come down. And this is where, if you're going to be breathing, you do a slow chest breathing during the increment. And as you come to the peak or the acme of the contraction, it, you get a little faster. And, that's, and then, then as you basically come down the decretment, you, you get her back to slow chest as soon as possible. And the reason why we want to get to slow chest as soon as possible is because I do not want my patient to hyperventilate. Okay. All right. So again, nursing tip, provide emotional support, please, to the laboring woman so she is less anxious and fearful.
I always said my patient is very fearful. She she cannot dilate. You know, it's like trying to dilate a brick wall. So I want to take care of the anxiety and the fear, fear so that she can progress. We want these women to progress in labor. Okay, so that was about the powers of the, of the um, labor and birth process. Now we got the passage of the passageway, and it's the pelvis. And you got the bony pelvis, and you have the true pelvis, and you have the false pelvis. So basically what you learn is the true pelvis is directly involved in childbirth. You got the inlet, the mid pelvis, and the outlet, and then the false pelvis. You have the upper portion of the pelvis, and so just just have an idea of of the pelvis and how it you know all plays into part for this baby to come down. That's why the gynecoid is the best. Um, and then of course our little passenger, he's got to not be too big because the head is usually um, bigger than anything else. And so we have all these great little diameters here. And just to show you, um, you know, the centimeters, how, what they have to be measuring in order to get this head through a pelvis. Not easy. And what I'd like, just like you to know here is, because you'll have this in newborn, is the um, anterior um, fontanelle. Um, this is, looks like a diamond, doesn't it? And then you have the occipital fontanelle back here. And you see, this is more like a little crescent, you know? So, and then you can see here, you have the different suture line, okay? And this allows the head to mold as the um, baby descends. And then you have how this little passenger is lying inside. And so the lie, the definition is the position of the fetus in relation to the maternal spine. So it's just the relationship, how he's laying to mom's backbone. Okay. So here you have a, what we call the longitudinal line. And is he's up and down. See vertex, he, his head is presenting. On um, this side, this uh, little drawing here is a transverse lie. And you can see how this baby is lying. He's lying across mom. Okay, so you can see the difference too in mom's belly, um, how it how the, how her belly would look. Okay, and you can't you cannot deliver vaginally if you were to try transverse lie, cannot. All right, and then of course the passenger. Oh, different presentations as he's presenting. You have a shoulder down here. You can see how the shoulder is. You have Mr. Frank breach. With his little feet up here by his head. You got a full breach. You got a footling, how he's coming down. And then you have different different uh, ways the head is. Um, remember, I cannot, this is like a face presentation here. You can't deliver um, with that. But I did have one time, I did have a, a baby that did deliver with a face presentation. Because mom came in, she was quite dilated. And so... There was no way of stopping. Um, she was um, about to deliver, and um, she was right there, and it was the face that was presenting. And poor little guy, his face was so, so bruised, but he did okay. Okay, excuse me. Now I'm going to um, go into the psych portion of the labor and birth process. And again, we went over this quite a bit, where the mental state can influence the course of labor. And the woman's cultural and individual values influence how she will cope with childbirth. Exactly. Alrighty. And again, this is in different classifications of fetal um, presentations and position. So what we want to take from this, and this comes right out of your book, and this is on page one. 31, and it just shows you the different positions a baby's gets in. Now, just for your notes, please, OA, which is occipital anterior, is the most favorable for vaginal delivery. And that's because the head is nicely tucked down and the occipital portion of the baby's head now is facing to mom's front, her interior. All right. She has a better labor too when you have an OA presentation. And, and because OP would be occipital posterior, and also posterior um, is noted to have longer labors and more painful labor. Please remember that. 
longer labors and more painful. So especially in the beginning of labor, oh my gosh. And when you have a baby in OP position, mom has such back pain and it's low back pain. And that's where that counter sacral pressure is so important so that it gives her some relief. But this is what this is all about. So all you have to do is see the pelvis here. And then it's, it's breaking down into four parts. And you can see the right side and then the left side. And then you can see here where we talked about the OA position, how nicely tucked down he is. Just here's left OA. And then here is OP. You can see the difference. See how the head is nicely tucked. The chin is nicely tucked down. On this one, you see the difference? The chin is like up. up. So that's why it caused mom so much pain. And let me tell you, she has a longer labor. Again, I'm going to reiterate, longer labor and her pushing is longer. Now, they can deliver an OP position. They can, but it just takes longer and the pushing is significantly harder. All right. And then the other presentation you see is OT, which is transverse. Okay. Now, OT is you can't get through there. So a lot of times what we do is we go up and we'll go ahead and try to flip this head into an OA position. Now I've had babies where they were in OT position and we went up and we tried to manipulate and try to move them. And as soon as we got them into OA position, I left my fingers out, he flipped back into OT. Okay, Mom had ended up with a C-section, very hard. All right, moving right along, we have signs of impending labor. Now, Brass and Hicks is a good sign of impending labor. That means the labor is what? It's coming, okay? Um, a lot of ladies, I mean, they want to go into labor so bad, they want to become 40 weeks, and they're looking, okay, is it time? Is it time? But the Brass and Hicks, you know, sometimes we think, too, even though they're irregular contractions and they're kind of annoying, um, they... The research has shown that um, they, they start to maybe soften up the cervix a little bit. And so that's a good thing. Um, also, you have increased mental discharge. Labor is coming, folks. You may have um, that bloody show, that mucus and blood mixed in together. That's impending labor. And then, of course, rupture of membranes. Um, once she ruptures, um, she has 24 hours and she must be delivered. When you go past 24 hours from the ori original um, time of rupture, um, she can she can get infected, okay? And so if mom gets the temperature and infection, baby is going to get affected too. And then, of course, another good sign of impending labor would be energy spur. They get, oh, they get an energy, energy spur. Okay. All right. So we're going to move right along. And we're going to talk about the mechanisms of labor. Now, these also are called the cardinal movements of labor. And they're just kind of nice. And you can see in your book on page 133, they have, you know, they have this in pictures. And it's kind of neat where you see how the, the baby has to descend. And that's what we call station. And then baby has to be engaged. Okay. So baby now has dropped down. And then he has, um, he flexes his head and then he does like an internal rotation. Then he extends, okay? And then he does a external rotation of the head and then he comes out. So this is pretty neat. Um, if you were uh, going to be a nurse uh, midwife, um, pretty good that we do learn all this and how to have, see how this baby moves his head. Again, it is so important as he's making all these rotations and coming down, that his head is not too big. And then the pelvis. Now, can you see why the pelvis would have to be um, a, a, like the gynecoid to give a good opening for this head to come down? Thank goodness that his the suture line, the head gives, the connected tissues not all together, you know? It, it molds. It's it's phenomenal how it can mold down. And sometimes you see a baby who's been in the in the pelvis a long time. Um, by the time they come out, they got quite a bit of what we call molding. Okay, but 
Yeah, because um, some ladies, they carry love during their pregnancy. And in a way, that's good. In a way, it's not. But they have more, of course, um, pelvic pressure during the pregnancy. And then also, um, baby, um, his head gets quite molded. So you ever hear the expression cone head? Well, <laughs> that's why. Okay, so here we have what we call station. And that's when we, remember we talked about that just in the mechanisms of labor right here on the descent. This is how the baby comes down. So you have the pelvis and you have these really pointy areas right here. That's called the ischial spine. And you can really feel them when you go in and check a woman. And any that's our landmark. So the ischial spine is, is, we call that the zero station. Because we really can gauge from that point. So anything that's above the ischial spine is a minus. So minus one, minus two, minus three, minus four, nine, minus five. Now, anything below the ischial spine is a plus, like plus one, plus two, plus three, plus four, and plus five. Well, plus five, we're delivered. Okay. So when we, when we talk about um, progression of labor, we're talking about centimeters. How many centimeters is your patient dilated? When we talk about effacement, how thin that cervix is, and then we say station, um, then we say, Baby's at a minus one, minus two, you might have heard. So that's what we're describing. So we're describing how many centimeters she's open. Okay. We're describing how much the cervix is real soft. And then, because that, 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 when that becomes 100% soft, then it's much easier for dilation to occur. And then the station, the baby coming down, the descent. Okay. So here again is a really neat um, mechanisms of labor, how um, they they move, come to how they come down. It's amazing how these little guys they they know. I had one patient. Let me tell you. I think I'll make you laugh on this. I had one patient that said, "How does my baby know how how to come down?" And she was real serious. And I said, "Oh, it's amazing. They they just know that you have to make their way down, and they do. All babies know." find their way so she wanted she said well if I could if I could put a flashlight there could he see the light and I said no we don't we don't have to do that they're really smart so I hope I gave you a little laugh okay now when we go to the hospital the birth center okay it's really sometimes this they make a couple trips okay and then you send them home and they get kind of sad and they go oh I, it wasn't time, but normally when you have contractions and they're and they're regular contractions, um, and they're lasting like I mean like maybe three to four minutes apart, maybe they could be their frequency, and the duration of them could be sixty, uh, could be a minute, you know, sixty seconds, and um, when they come, um, the patient perceives them as pretty painful. Okay, um, those pretty good time to, to go to the hospital. So according to how far you, where you live. And then of course, if you're a multigravida, you go to the hospital a little sooner because your labor could be a lot shorter. Um, first time mummies on um, normally, not that, and of course things can be, there can be out, women out there having their first baby and they go through quite quickly, but um, normal for a first baby um, they can start to come in and they start feeling contractions, um, like uh, pretty rhythmic contractions every four minutes and um, lasting about a minute. And, um, and they usually say it's pretty painful. Okay. Now, when you go to the hospital, when your bag of water breaks, now we talked about that already. So important um, when the bag of water breaks that she knows the time and, um, and the color. This is what mom notices. And um, especially the time, because we need we only have 24 hours from the original time of, um, of membranes being ruptured. Now, bleeding. Now, bleeding other than bloody show. Okay. And so maybe her cervix is opening real quick and she's having more bleeding or something's going on with the placenta that we need to get, get going. Once you have that kind of bleeding, you need to get to the hospital because the baby will be affected. Um, any times of decreased speed of movement, it's time to come to the hospital. And then, you know, truthfully, any other, um, you know, anything concern mom has, 
we tell them, come to the hospital. It's better to be on that side and to tell them and we call that the safe side, um, to tell them to go to the hospital so that we can assess the, uh, both of them and make sure if the fetus is, is, is okay. It's still good. Um, fetal heart rate is between 110 and 160, which is the normal fetal heart rate. Okay, so now you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna remit her, okay? So this is three major assessments that you're going to do um, promptly on admission. Okay, so we're always going to put the fetal monitor on. That's the standard of care. And um, make sure again, 110 to 160 are no. Anything below 110 is fetal bradycardia and anything above 160 is called fetal tachycardia. And we wanna look at the variability. You know, those little squiggly lines I talked about the other day. We wanna look at variability, make sure that baby is good. It's called fetal well being. Now, on the other hand too, we're gonna be doing mom. All right, so we got mom's blood pressure cup on. We're taking her temperature, getting her heart rate um, to make sure that she's okay because um, I want to make sure her blood pressure is good. And I want to make sure that uh, I, I see her OB record and I want to see what what kind of blood pressure she, she was running in the office during her pregnancy compared to when she comes into the hospital. And then it can cause two. I'm going to check her. You do a sterile vag exam and I'm um, going to see how many centimeters she's dilated. Because she could come in and she could be quite dilated. She could be any eight centimeters, nine. I've had, I've had patients walk in completely dilated, ready to deliver. And then it's happened. Um, I had a lady that delivered right in the triage room. Now, triage rooms are small. So um, the warmer had to be outside the room. We couldn't move her. She was. She came in. She was ready to deliver. She was right on, almost on the perineum, and um, one push, and the baby was out. So you can see what kind of a situation we're in. And so we just had enough room, basically, for the doctor and myself. And um, we had the um, fetal monitor. And so we were monitoring the baby, make sure everything was okay. Everybody was okay. Just hot. She just came in quite dilated. That's what happens. So you always know what to do. All right. So here's your admission pr procedures. Now this is for a normal, you know, laboring patient that comes in and now you're going to admit her. And so you want to get all your permits and your consents. I'm going to be truthful. I get all my consents done right in the beginning. And even if my patient says, I do not want to have an epidural, that's okay, but I'm still going to get a consent form. And the reason why we do all that is because ahead of time is because when she does get into active labor and all of a sudden she realizes, I really do want an epidural, um, that's not the time to get an informed consent. Because that's why you're getting consents is the patient being, has been informed of the procedure. And when you're in pain, you're not going to listen to much. And so we got everything done when she's not in active labor. Okay. And then you have your standard labor, uh, laboratory test that the doctor has. We usually have standing orders in labor delivery. So we get a CBC and we get a coagulation and we get a UA just to make sure what's going on. We get a baseline. I've got an IV going. <laughs> Excuse me. Labor delivery, we start our IVs with 18 gauges. Um, and then if yeah, she's in labor, because you have to give a lot of fluids and you have to get them in quick sometimes. And then we give medication through an IV. And then um, for the epidural, we need to have a good line. And then if she ends up with a C section, we have to have a good line. And then if she ends up getting blood, we have a, uh, the ability of, of infusing through that. So that's why an 18 is good, it's preferable. You never know when you work labor deliveries like working in the ER, you never know what's gonna happen. And we're always thinking, critically thinking ahead of time, okay? And so this is where it all comes into play. And so we need to be prepared. And so we don't wanna be there where we're trying to get blood and we don't have a big enough gauge of the IV so we want to make sure we have it. Um, and then, of course, on a mission, we want to make sure we the fetal position and presentation. I do not want to be laboring someone if they have a breach presentation. 
because the doctors don't labor breaches, we go ahead and they C-section. So we want to make sure that the head is, is presenting, okay? And we call that a vertex presentation. All righty. So again, when you have somebody who's coming in, a lot has to be done. And that's why you, you get very organized in your work because you you have a lot to, that needs to be done before anything happens. Okay. So getting back to comparison of, of false labor and true labor. Well, the major comparison is in false labor, the contractions are irregular, okay? And so like walking kind of relieves the contractions. They kind of dwindle out um, when walking. Bloody show usually doesn't have any bloody show and there's no change. Main thing, there's no change in cervical dilation or effacement. So that's false labor. Okay, so it's kind of easy to remember. There is no change in cervix, okay? But you have somebody who's in true labor when this is what the, tri the triage nurse goes through. She has to make the decision between someone in false labor versus true labor because you don't want to send anybody home who's in true labor. So true labor, the contractions, you know, they gradually do get into a good regular pattern and they become the contractions become stronger and they're more effective. And then when she goes out to walk, they increase in the intensity. And she's got a lot of discomfort in her low back and her abdomen. You know, they usually hold their tummies when they have a contraction. And then the bloody show is often present, which is good because that means the cervix is opening up. And then you have, you do have dilation and effacement. So say she on a mission when you were looking at uh, first looked at her, um, you did a sterile vag exam and she was maybe two centimeters, okay, and she was maybe um, sixty percent face and a minus one station, okay, and she's having contractions, but I'm going to send her and 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 your fetal heart rate is one twenty and it ha and 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 the baby has moderate amount of variability, so everything is good. So what we're going to do is we're going to send her out walking. And she goes walking for uh, half an hour, comes back. We check fetal heart rate, send her back out walking. Okay, so after an hour of contractions, regular contractions, she comes back in and she's really, oh my goodness, the contractions have really intensified. They really got worse, nurse. So okay. And I always say, well, that's good. <laughs> and usually my patient goes, ah, ah, no. But anyway, it is good. And so um, I do a, another, you know, I check her blood pressure and all the vital signs. I check the baby, the fetal heart rate. And now I'm going to do another sterile vag exam only to determine if there's any more progression of, of cervical dilation and effacement. And normally there is. So what am I going to do? She now is three centimeters. She is now completely effaced. And the baby came down to a zero station. She in labor? Yes, she's in labor. So we're doing pretty good because she's just at that point now. She's going from the latent phase into more active phase. So yes, the contractions will intensify. So that's a good time. We have to get those consent forms signed so that when she does get a little more dilated, um, she'll be in the more active phase and then she'll probably want an epidural. All right. So here's your little brain teaser. So heads up. So you have a laboring woman and she's uncomfortable and her labor has slowed down. Oh, so which instructions do the nurse give to the, to the patient or the client to help stimulate labor? Well, we should put her on complete bed rest. Well, that's not going to stimulate labor. Um, position the client onto her left side. Well, that's not going to stimulate labor. Place the client on bath bathroom privileges only. No, the question's asking me. Which instructions should the nurse give to the client to help stimulate labor? And the fourth one says, encourage the woman to ambulate or to walk. And that is true. That's what helps to stimulate labor. So you see how if you're kind of looking at it and you're saying, hmm, which one is it? Always go back to the question. And, and, it, and so it tells me that she's uncomfortable, but they kind of slow down a little bit. So it means I got to probably get it going.
So now the next part of the question is, which instruction should the nurse give to the client to help stimulate labor? So that's what the question's asking me. Which of the following would stimulate labor? And the one that would stimulate labor would be to encourage the woman to ambulate. All right. So here's your nursing care before birth. Okay, so now we got her in labor. So you got her admitted. Um, you're you're watching the you're monitoring the baby. You're monitoring mommy, okay, and and see how she handles the labor, and you're helping her to cope with it. And so we always got to monitor the baby. And this is an example of a Hewlett Packard machine, and um, it's very accurate. And so here, right, this top portion right here is the fetal heart rate tracing. And then down here is the um, uterine contraction, okay? So remember, this is a legal document. And so if they're on each little page is numbered. So if there is anything, any of this missing after the birth of the baby is, is not good. Um, lawyers will, will find that. And then um, you need to come up with what what happened. Okay, so a lot of ladies like, well, can I have a sample of the mom, you know, the baby's tracing? And I go, no, because they're all numbered and I need to keep them in sequence. Okay, so again, fetal heart rate normal is 110 to 160. Anything below 110 would be bradycardia. And then anything above 160 would be fetal tachycardia. This is an a, um, example of electronic medic, um, fetal monitoring, okay? Okay, and it does have the ability to take mom's blood pressure, heart rate, and the baby's um, heart rate is right here and here. She right now, she's at, this is the contraction, and it's only a 20, she's at 22, so she's really resting, that's a resting tone um, right here, see, but here. So here she had a contraction. And here it comes down, and now she's at a resting time. All right. Here is another example of the monitor. Again, this one here, this baby looks like he's sleeping, okay? But it doesn't look like she's having too much um, uterine activity. Okay. So anytime you have a fetal heart rate that's outside of the normal limits, any slowing of the heart rate, especially if that persists after the contraction ends, that's called a late deceleration, um, is promptly reported to healthcare provider because late deceleration is caused by uterine placental insufficiency. Never good. And remember, um, veal chop, okay? And I had you write that down the other day. Just write down V-E-A-L, and then across V stands for variables. And the variables is caused by force compression. So put the C, so on this side, put C-H-O-P. And then, so again, variables, the V, variables caused by force compression. Then the next one is E, and that would be for <laughs> early decelerations. And early decelerations are caused by head compression. And then you have A, accelerations and they are a-okay -okay. yes okay and then you have um what's the last one the l for late decelerations and that's caused by uterine placenta insufficiency all righty now this is a, uh, a slide on showing you what's reassuring and what's non-reassuring fetal heart rate patterns okay well Reassuring is if the baby's heart rate is nice and stable, yay, it has moderate amount of variability, that's always good. It has all those squiggly lines that we talked about. Accelerations would be an A cell would go up and then come down. That's always good. It's an indication of fetal well-being. And then uterine contractions. You know, they're they're like every two to three minutes. They don't, they're not greater then um two minutes so you have some time in between um duration is less than 90 seconds remember i said from 60 to 90 in duration okay but we don't want to get too long because that would cause the fetal heart rate to go down and so those are what we call reassuring 
if I was laboring somebody and I had those kind of patterns going, I'd be okay. I'd be very happy. Now, on the other hand, you have some non-reassuring. So those would be like tachycardia, 170 and above. Bradycardia would be like 110 and below. Um, decrease or absent variability, not good. Those little squiggly lines, we need those little squiggly lines. Okay, and then late decelerations are never good because they're caused by uterine placenta insufficiency. And even variable decelerations can be um, non-reassuring, especially if they're prolonged variables that last too much, last too long. The variables are like, um, I, drew, I drew that on the board the other day. It's like, a, it goes down and up. That means it's a sudden drop and then it has a quick recovery. Sudden drop, quick recovery. That's a variable. So if my patient uh, had a lot of variables, um, even though the cause by core compression, um, definitely have to be changing her position quite a bit in order to um, get rid of those variables or to make them less intense. Okay. All righty. So here we are. Here's an example of late decelerations. Again, here's your contraction, okay? And here's your late. Here's a contraction, and here is your late, okay? So you're having contractions, and the baby, you know, doesn't look good. And actually, if you turn, if, if in real life, if you turn that monitor strip around, um, it looks like a contraction pattern. So this is not good. So we don't like this. This is late decelerations. And remember, I gave you that cartoon. It's never good to be late. It's never good to be late for class. Remember that, okay? So we don't like late decelerations because this baby is going to be getting in trouble. Now, it does have a little bit of variability. See these little squiggly lines? But here he's he lost those squiggly lines. Okay, he's saying, nurse... I don't think I can continue like this. And what happens if you don't do any interventions? Um, this baby is going to um, decel and stay down. And then he'll be, um, he's actually dying at that time. Okay, so that's why you have to get those babies out. So here you have a brain teaser. So a nurse is caring for a patient in labor, and she knows the fetal heart rate is in the 90s after a uterine contraction. So which nursing priority intervention should the, should the nurse perform? Notify the provider, turn the patient to her side, increase the patient's pitocin, or encourage her to take deep breaths. So again, which priority intervention should the nurse perform? I'll let you um, answer that and look that up. We had that the other day. Okay, let's go on to inspection of amniotic fluid. All right, so when you look at amniotic fluid, we're gonna look at the color. So you have to know the norm in order to know what? The abnormal. So the normal is clear fluid and it might have flecks of white vernix in it. So remember, Norm is clear. When you have green stained fluid, it indicates the fetus passed some meconium. So it could be like, don't forget, meconium definition is the first stool. So he had his first stool before he was born. That's never good. And that can really lead to fetal compromise. Okay. So this is never, we don't want meconium stained fluid, but we see it a lot. Um, because sometimes the baby's under some form of distress. Odor, the odor should not, it should not have a smell. Mm -mm. If it has a smell, it's, it's, it has an infection. And then these are the amounts. You have scant, which is a trickle, moderate, which is 500 mLs, and large is like a thousand or greater. When you are looking, when you have somebody that purchased the membranes, the first priority that you need to worry about is the fetal heart rate. That's the first priority. That's what getting back to the question on first priority, and I believe you have that on your quiz, um, you have to be 
you have to be always assessing um, when the membranes rupture. Mm -hmm. Because why? Why do you think? Why do you think? Is because you could have a cord prolapse. Okay, you could have a cord prolapse, and that when that's not good. That's again, the baby's in trouble. Okay, all right. So that's the inspection of the amniotic fluid. All right, we're always monitoring our woman in labor, vital signs, contractions. Is she making progress? What's well, how you know? Because don't forget, um, it's a long, drawn-out process sometimes. You want to make sure the kidneys are, are functioning correctly and, you're, and whatever you're putting in, you're getting, you're getting out. And, of course, her response to, to labor. Absolutely. So, you know, Lamaze is um, an organization, too, that, you know, um, they have some basic practices set up. And this is basically for anybody for maternity care. Um, and lots, a lot of times this is in the birth birth um, centers. Um, that labor should begin on its own. That means we're not going to induce, okay? Um, women should have freedom of movement. Yeah, they can get up and move around and, and uh, get in the shower. And so they're not what we call tied to the bed. Um, women should have a birth support person or doula. Absolutely. Um, and a doula is someone in, in the room that's giving extra support to the laboring woman. Um, and then no routine intervention should be performed, right? Because we do have some new routine interventions, such as an amniotomy, where they come and break the bag of water, because that does help um, intensify the contractions. And then women should be in a non-supine position. Well, we never put a woman in supine position, but this is what they say to, to make sure that nobody puts the patient on their back. And then women should not be separated from the infant. No. And um, we do that in the hospital too. Um, we have, we believe in strongly about bonding and we have the skin to skin where baby comes out and goes right on mom's, chest okay so the brain teaser here you go heads up please is a woman in active labor she's experiencing a spontaneous rupture of membranes which nursing action are appropriate at this time now this one is a select will apply okay so we talked about record the color of fluid yeah monitor the fetal heart rate for a full minute absolutely record the time of the spontaneous rupture of membrane yes and record the amount of fluid. Absolutely. Those are my nursing actions that it's at this time. Okay. You know, helping someone cope with labor is very challenging. And when they're in the latent phase, I would have my patients, you know, walking around and, you know, relaxing, getting in the shower. Um, you know, we had the birthing ball. Um, you know, get you, she's not in bed, you know. Now um we we assess fetal heart rate, send her out walking, comes back in. Um, you know, if we keep our, our patients pretty active in the labor, it helps co with coping. Um, there's your doula again. So it's a heads up, please, to know that. And it's a doula again is trained to provide emotional and physical support during labor and delivery. They don't have to be a medical person, no. They just have to go through a certification for that. And anybody can be a doula, but it does help. A lot of um, retired labor and delivery nurses do this. Okay, and then you have, you know, you do a lot of teaching, right? Because maybe she did go through childbirth classes, but now she's in really, she's and she's having the pains and she's heard about them, but she forgot maybe how to do the breathing. So you're always, you know, going over, and reinforcing um, the the breathing with them so that they can they can cope. Okay, always provide encouragement. Always, I always say to my patient, every contraction is one less toward our goal of, of our beautiful baby, and they always love that. It is every contraction is one less, and then supporting and teaching the partner. You know, you have whoever's in the room with her. Um, their attitudes are really, really important and supportive. 
and make sure that, you know, they get what they need. And then, of course, um, if she has an epidural, that we take care of her um, effectively, make sure we give her IV bolus before the epidural, make sure her blood pressure doesn't go down, which causes hypotension. So we want to go ahead and take care of her during epidural anesthetic. Okay. All righty. Um, in this chapter, it does go over the stages and phases of labor. The first stage is your longest stage. It has three phases. It has your latent phase. It has your active phase and transition. Now, in your book, it does have these very nicely. And um, you can look at them, too, because I love um, how your book puts it. Let me get that page for you. Uh, because it does give you, like, the behaviors that's going on in each each um, phase, which is important because sometimes questions um, can ask you what kind of behavior is, should they give you the behavior, they'll describe the behavior to you and then they ask you what phase is she in? So you really have to know that. And uh, uh, in your book is on page 155 and it has the different phases. Okay, so like the latent phase, you know, from zero to three centimeters, and um, and then your active phase. Now, in your book, it does say, I'm reading now here, and it does have the cervix dilated from one to four. It's just, a, it's okay. It's just according to which book you're reading. But, um, and then you have your active phase. So now she's getting, her contractions are getting closer and she's dilated. Okay, she could be now from anywhere from four to seven centimeters, okay? That's a really good time as we're discussing this to get an epidural, by the way. Um, by now she's four centimeters, completely effaced, and she's at a zero station. She's really, she's doing good. Her progression has been well, so we can give her the epidural. Because a lot of times epidurals though, um, research will show that it doesn't slow labor, but sometimes it can slow the contractions just a little bit, take some of the intensity down. And that's okay, because we can always, what, augmentate. Okay. And then you have your transition. Okay. Well, this one, she's kind of very much, she's irritable. And she might not be too happy with her support person. This is the time that sometimes I've seen women kind of slap the band around and go, this is your fault. And, um, and the husband looks at me and I go, it's okay. This is soon to be over. She's quite dilated now. And we're, we're going to have a baby pretty soon. So hang in there with us. And then um, sometimes her legs get all tremor. And so um, it, 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 it goes by very quickly, though, transition. Okay. Now, if she has an epidural, obviously, she's going to, you know, really cope well with this. Um, uh, I've had patients to actually sleep. They had been through a long latent phase and now they got their epidural as they got a little more dilated into the active phase. And so now they're, they're exhausted. So they go to sleep. So I have the monitor, I have the beetle monitor on. She's on her, she has, she's on the left tilt. Um, the uh, Her blood pressure monitor is on. I got the pulse oximeter on. Her IV is infusing. And so then I dim down the lights and usually husbands sleep too during this time. Everybody sleeps. But my my role is to monitor mom and baby and her contractions and to make sure that we keep going. Okay, so this is a nice time. Usually I'm, I have patients that slept right through and when I saw the fetal heart rate have a deceleration, I go, okay, baby must be coming down. I saw head compression. So that, remember that's early deceleration. So I see the head, I do a vag exam, and sure enough, she's complete. So I, then it's so nice, guys. I have to wake up my patient saying, okay, it's time to push. You're completely dilated. And she goes, oh, my gosh, I'm, I'm, I'm almost, almost, I'm dilated. I'm, I'm 10. And I said, yeah. So now we got to push. Time to wake up. And you know what? They push really good, especially if they've had that sleep. Believe me, it works like a charm. And so, and then I had to remove the Foley catheter that I had, in her while uh, we had the uh, epidural while we were laboring, keep her bladder empty. Remember, always had to keep the bladder empty so the baby's head can come down even better when the bladder is empty. Okay, 
So that was my first stage of labor. And so we go into now she's completely dilated. So now we're going to go into the second stage. And this can last from 30 minutes to two hours. Now, remember I told you about that occipital posterior position of the baby? They push harder, okay? It's going to be the two hours. If they're occipital anterior, then, um, and they're good pushers, <laughs> we can get it out a lot quicker, okay? And this is the time, too, that nurses, we do some perineal massage. And so we can... Basically, the, the bottom of um, the perineal uh, floor can stretch out really nice because we're getting that, that skin to stretch in order to prepare for delivery. Okay, and you can see on um, page 153 in your book, they have a really nice figure, 6.23 of a vaginal birth. Really, really nice. And you can, you can see how the baby does um, come out and how he does his external rotation. Okay, so then we have the baby coming out. Now, the next thing that needs to be removed is the placenta. So it's like having, almost having in like another baby. We have to wait and we have a contraction. And then the placenta, we want that to come right off the wall, the endometrium. And so we have to be very patient. That can take anywhere from five to 30 minutes. And we don't want to be rushed. We want, don't want any pulling of the, on the placenta because if they do that, they could leave a fragment up there of the placenta and that would cause her to hemorrhage at the delivery, which is never good. So we have the time. So the placenta is so important that it has its own stage. Okay. And then the fourth stage is her recovery time. Okay. And that's that lasts about one to two hours. And, and 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 we have the patient back in the labor room for a good hour after delivery, and we do that to make sure that she what everything is um is good, and we do that um to make sure that the fundus is firm, and so we check the fundus of the uterus to make sure it's firm. So after delivery, the fund, the uterus needs to be mid -line, midline, okay, right in the middle, and at the level of the umbilicus, her belly button. That's where it should be at the delivery. So again, the uterus is mid midline and is at the level of the umbilicus. Okay, now that's after delivery. And her lochia would be lochia rubra. Remember, is lochia is the discharge. So right after delivery, she's going to have bright red bleeding and be lochia rubra. Then it goes into lo lochia serosa, and then it goes in lochia alba. But right after delivery that we're talking about now would be the rubra. So I'm going to make sure that her IV is good. I got the toast and go into the IV to make her uterus contract. I'm making sure that her bladder doesn't get full. And if it does, and um, she cannot, she can't go on a bedpan, then all I have to do is straight use a straight cath again, okay, to get the to get the urine out. Because if the if the bladder gets really full, it'll push the uterus up, displace it. It'll go over to the side, and usually it goes over to the right side, but it doesn't matter. It goes over the side, and she has more bleeding, and usually then the the uterus will become boggy. And that's never good. So I'm going to have the bladder empty. So my uterus is midline. It's at the level of the umbilicus. She has a moderate amount of lochia rubra. And um, if she had an episiotomy, I'm going to put ice on it for the first 24 hours. Okay. So now we're going to go into a, um, vaginal birth after cesarean. Now these are called, this is called a, VBAC, vaginal birth as a cesarean. What you have to really worry about here is the uterus um, and it can rupture, okay? Remember when they had a cesarean, they're having an incision, not only in the skin, but it's gonna be on that uterus. And that incision on the uterus makes the uterus what? Weak, okay? And so um, it's never as tight as it was before it, okay? So 
they have to be watched very careful. Now, on this kind of a situation, they cannot be induced. N-O-T, not inducible. Um, you can never give Pitocin to a VBAC. Now, that could be on exam number two. And so you can never give never give Pitocin. Because um, Pitocin contractions are different than spontaneous contractions. Remember, I told you a couple of weeks ago, Pitocin is very, very strong, okay? So you can never give that to a VBAC because you definitely could have a uterine rupture. And when you have the uterus that opens up and ruptures, um, it's very serious. You can kill the baby, you can kill mom. I had one lady that she came in and every she's were very, very low. We went ahead and went to the back. She was a, she was a VBAC. She was um, a, a lady that wanted to go into spontaneous labor. She started having these massive contractions and what happened, her uterus did rupture. Mm -hmm. And so- um, we opened her up doing a C-section. I was assisting and sure enough, the baby was floating outside of the uterus. Now the, it was still connected to the placenta and the cord was okay. So the baby's just floating outside the uterus. Okay. And what you have to worry about is that this type of patient could hemorrhage. Okay. And hemorrhage, they go quickly on you and they go into shock. And so we want to make sure that you know, this does not happen. So you have to be very careful with these VBACs. And you might hear another expression called, they're called TOLAX, um, T-O-L-A-C. That's a trial of labor after cesarean. All righty, we're going to move right along. So what's the nurse's responsibility during birth? Well, it's a busy room. And I tell you, we had um, many, many years, we had LPNs um, helping out in the labor room. Um, they were really good. They helped us with our instruments. So they were responsible for um, all the delivery instruments and getting the infant um, equipment, the radio warmer, everything set up in the room, um, making sure that um, they helped out with doing the scrubs, perineal scrub. Um, and that really helped, okay? Um, nurses, we were there. The RN gives the Pitocin in the room. Um, and then we both can do initial care to the infant. The LPN and the RN works as a team. And we're assessing APGAR and um, assessing the infant for obvious abnormalities. We always look to see, make sure everything's there, it's supposed to be there. And if there's anything extra like a little um, digit or anything, we have to take note to that. And then um, a lot of times the LPN will go ahead and look at the placenta and then I'll um, look at it too and make sure there's nothing missing, okay? And um, it helps. Another person in the room always helps because it's a, everything goes by so quickly and there's so much going on and um, there's, there's a lot of bleeding that happens too. Um, and then we write the bands out. So we want to identify mother and infant and that infant never leaves that room, the labor room, the operating room, wherever the delivery may occur, um, does not leave without being banded, okay? So baby gets two bands, one on the wrist and the other one on the ankle with a security band and then uh, mom has her um, hospital band on. Now she's going to have the ID band. That same number that's on her band will be on the baby's bands. And then the significant other um, support person that she designates gets a band. And again, the number is going to be the same. It will match mom's bracelet and that matches the baby's bracelet. Um, so anybody that tries to get into the nursery without a bracelet does not happen. We we have our unit is a lockdown unit. So is the nursery. Um, and also we we make sure that there's proper bonding, you know, skin to skin bonding, sure. Um, that's where we're very much into that and make sure that mom and, and daddy is and whoever's in the room with mom, they everybody bonds together. Okay. It has a lot to do with um psychological um well well being of the of the infant too. Okay. All right, so now we are in to the immediate um, 
third and fourth stages of labor. And I think I went over this already, but that when the bait, when the placenta does come out, okay, in that third stage of labor, it, we know how it comes out. Now, it, you have two sides of placenta. You have the shiny Schultz. And I say shiny is because it does look shiny. And that that's a newborn side. So I say shiny, new, you know, newborn. Okay. And then the Duncan is called, um, we always study this this way, and I'm just going to pass it on to you. It's called the dirty Duncan because that's mom's side. That's the side that was adhered to her uh, endometrium. And so it has all those little lobes to it, you know, and um, we want to make sure that we look at it very carefully, that there's nothing missing. Okay. And now we go to the fourth stage. And we've already been talking about the fourth stage that we just talked about on the previous screen. But here again, it just goes over again what happens during the fourth stage. So if I was to ask you, um, let's see, the nurse is caring for a client delivering her third child. Okay. So which of the following indicates the client is in the fourth stage of labor? So. Would you think it would be dilation and effacement? No, that's not the fourth stage. What's the fourth stage? Recovery. Okay. Um, expulsion of the placenta? No, because that's the third stage. Transition phase? No, that's part of that's part, that's the last phase of the first stage of labor. Or would it be the first one to two hours after birth. Well, that's what we're discussing. The one to two hours after birth. Okay. All right, and that's the same one, same brain teaser, okay? So just want to go ahead and keep going. So here's your nursing care now immediately after birth, okay? So you got to carry your mom, of course, your vital signs, okay? I'm always assessing for hemorrhage. That's why I want to make sure that fundus is nice and firm and at the level of the embolitis, okay? Um, I'm going to look at mom's skin color. Is she pale? We'll always look at the mucous membranes. Um, I just, I, and her lochia, her discharge. How much is she having? And in your book, you have some really nice pictures of the um, pads and, 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 and how many centimeters a saturated pad is. And so that's how, you know, you want to chart um, that too. And then you have pain. Is mom in pain? Okay, and so because what you're doing after she delivers, what you're doing is you're giving her Pitocin. Okay, and Pitocin, remember, makes you contract. And so we want her to contract after delivery because we want the uterus to be firm. Yeah, I know. Some people say, now I've had patients tell me that after they deliver, they had, they, their contractions were worse than when they were in labor. And that's because we're giving them Pitocin, everybody. That's why. And be, and that's because we want that uterus to be firm after delivery. Because there was a, that placenta coming off that endometrium. It's like having, let me tell you, it's like having an open wound. So imagine, okay, in, here's your uterus, right? And your placenta was up, a, remember, embedded in that upper portion of the uterus. Now it's coming off. So it's going to be an area that's going to be what? Wide open, like a cut. Sort of like a cut on your arm. You know, you have your arm, right? Here's my arm. And you have a cut, right? Okay. So what happens is that when when the skin opens up, it bleeds. Well, if you don't put pressure on that, it continues to bleed. Well, the same thing with the uterus and the placenta. The placenta comes off the wall of the, of the uterus. It has that open area. If I don't have that uterus contracting, contracting, okay, then that area will what? Will bleed. So that's why we give her Pitocin after delivery to make that uterus contract real tight. And so it puts pressure on that area. And that area that is, you control the bleeding. Okay. So. That's what goes on inside. So that's why I have to be careful. I have to monitor her bleeding very carefully after delivery. All right. And then, of course, you always want to provide comfort to the patient. We have warm blankets. We have a beautiful blanket warmer on every unit and keep them warm and dry. 
And then if they had an episiotomy, I want to reduce that swelling, okay, in the perineum. So you put a good ice pack on. And remember, because this is on exam number two, um, ice pack the first 24 hours. First 24 hours, always, you want to take down the inflammation that's swelling in the perineum. So you can put ice pack on the perineum for 24 hours. All right. All right. So here you go. Let's see. The nurse is observing a patient with a hemorrhage following a delivery. So which assessment finding indicates a um, maternal hemorrhage is occurring? All right. Well, we talked about shock. So got a hemorrhage. Patient going to shock. We got what? Tachycardia. Yeah. Continuous flow of bright red blood. Yep. Saturated peripad times three within one hour. Yep. Passing large blood clots. Yes. Um, those are all um, assessment findings that would indicate that my patient could be hemorrhaging or she is hemorrhaging. Okay. The firm um, fund is a mid midline position. No, that wouldn't be part of the finding. Okay. Because if she's having all the above, tachycardia, continuous flow, saturated pad, passing large clots, her fundus is not firm. It's, it is boggy and it's not midline. That's for sure. Okay. All right. Got another little brain teaser here. So the nurse assessing a client post-delivery notes that like the uterus be high and displaced to the side. Okay. So what is the nurse's priority action? All right. Well, I, doing nothing is never the answer. <laughs> and this is a normal finding because it's not a normal finding. Okay. So what's the question asking me again? The question is asking me. Um, she's The nurse is assessing a client post-delivery notes that their uterus is high and displaced the site. Oh, wow. I remember the, the instructor telling me that. The bladder was full. So would I assess for bladder distension? That would be the way. Okay. Oh, I got some more brain teasers. All right. So which nursing intervention should the nurse include for a client immediately after delivery to reduce bleeding and bruising of the perineum? All right. What did I just say? Apply an ice pack. Absolutely. Apply an ice pack to the perineum. Always, guys. Okay. So now we're going into the nursing care immediately after birth. And so now you've got the care of the newborn. All right. So the newborn biggest job is to adapt to what we call extra uterine life. Extra, E-X-T-R-A, uterine, U-T-E-R-I-N-E, life. That means I'm outside of the womb now. And, my, and the cord is cut. And I have to survive. Okay, so in phase one is they kind of they kind of put it into phases of, about about the newborn. So phase one would be from birth to one hour. Now this usually is in the delivery room. Okay, and so that's when you know everybody's in there and we got some bonding going on and we got skin to skin and baby's awake. You know, he's, he's, he's pretty good. He's, he goes, wow, what's going on around here? You know, the nurse is doing the APGAR scoring and, you know, mom is maybe being sewn up. There's a lot of stuff going on in here. Okay. Now, phase two is from one to three hours. Now, usually what happens, we take, this is a good time because baby now is sleeping. So now we can take, have daddy um, and the nursery nurse and baby go to the nursery. Meanwhile, labor and delivery nurses and LPN with her um, will clean up the patient and get her ready to tr be transferred over to the mother baby unit. So now everybody gets out of the room so that the nurses can can do their job and work on the patient and getting her clean. Because you want to, after, after delivery, you want to put a nice clean gown on your patient. You have a, you never take an IV um, empty out to the, out to the floor. No, that's a mother baby unit. No, no, no. I always, if I have another bag to hang up, I'll always put my 20 units of Pitocin in the bag for transfer. Okay. It's just nice to the nurses on mother baby. You know, we work as a team. Um, I make sure she got a clean peri pad and I clean her up. 
you know, if the delivery is quite messy with all the betadine or, and uh, so you want to go ahead and clean everything up, put a dry pad on and um, make mom. A lot of times my patients would comb their hair and put their lipstick on so that they, they look nice when they go out to mother baby unit. Okay. It makes them feel good. It makes a woman feel so good when she has her, she combs her hair and puts a little um, lipstick on. Okay. So that's a good time that they all be in the nursery. Okay. And then the phase three usually goes from two to 12 hours where now they're in the mother baby unit or the postpartum unit and they're rooming in with mom. Really nice time. And this is where, you know, always during any of these phases, we are always watching the baby um, to make sure that he's breathing okay. Another big important of um, the baby care is um, we have to maintain what we call thermoregulation. That basically is making sure that the baby's temperature stays normal um, because they can get cold. That's why we put a little hat on them so that he does so he doesn't escape from the top of his head. So that's why we dry them off and put a what dry blanket on. Um, very quickly. I'm always looking at their cardiopulmonary function. Um, we always observe for meconium. And always, 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 you always, when you bring the baby into the room, we're always checking what? Bands. Everybody has to have those bands on. And then um, we always are looking at baby for any kind of anything major anomalies or anything and then encouraging breastfeeding now i always tell my patients about breastfeeding and encourage them to do so i always say you could have five extra count 500 extra calories when you breastfeed i usually get a smile like oh wow that's good and then i usually say um you know breastfeeding is really convenient and then they kind of look at me, oh, yeah, yeah. And, but I always say, if you want to get it back in your skinny jeans, this would usually gets the young, young moms. You want to get back in your skinny jeans, breastfeed it. Cause the involution process, the, the, the uterus shrinking down, back down to his pre-pregnancy size is quicker when you breastfeed. Hmm. So that usually gets their attention quite quickly. Okay, and here are some pictures of a newborn under the radium warmer. And um, those radium warmers are beautiful. They can also overheat the baby. So that's why we put a probe on the baby. It's hooked into the radium warmer. So like right in here, there's like a little outlet. Uh, let's see if I get my little thing here. Little outlet, you plug it in here and then it, it you put it right on baby's right um side of his, at his abdomen and we can get we can take the baby's temperature nice nice so you don't overheat okay because we want to make sure that he stays warm but not overheat so we don't want to overcook him okay and then here we have is the apgar scoring and um we dr virginia apgar is the one that came up with the apgar scoring and what we do why we do this is so that um, we know what level of resuscitation um, we need to do um, for each um, a, um, time for the baby. So go to page 158 in your textbook, and it goes over very nicely. Um, I'm just going to tell you, table 6.7 um, has the app bar scoring, and it has um, what to expect. Like if you have a zero, you have, say, we have zero, one, and two. That's the scoring. And we do the score, APGAR scoring, done at one minute of birth and five minutes of birth. Okay. Now, if it's low at five minutes of birth, the baby is definitely going to be in the NICU and they're going to do another one at 15 and 20 minutes. Okay. But um, we're 10, 15, 20. So if you have, you're going to look at each, each category. So we're going to look at, say, heart rate. Now, obviously, if there's no heart rate, <clears throat> I give it a zero, but hopefully you have a heart rate. So if you have a heart rate and it's less than 100 beats per minute, less than 100 beats per minute, you're going to give it a one. If the heart rate is greater than 100 beats per minute, you're going to give it a two. Okay. Then we're going to assess respiratory effort. If there's no spontaneous respirations, you're going to give it a zero. If the baby has what we call a slow, weak cry, 
okay? You're gonna give it a one. And if a baby has a good cry, like a strong, real strong cry, spontaneous cry, I'm gonna give it a two. That's the best. I love to hear those cries. And then muscle tone. <clears throat> if the baby's limp, um, you give it a zero. If the baby has like little sluggish movements, um, it's just moving a little bit, but it's slow. I'll give it a one because he's trying. And then, of course, if he has spontaneous motion, he's moving all around. Um, I'm going to give him a nice fat two. Okay. And then reflex irritability. If there's no response to suction gently, or you know what I used to do? is tap the foot like this. I, I hear it. Boom, boom, boom. And um, if there's no none, then we got a problem then we have um, a zero. And then if I do that and he kind of grimaces, um, he's responding, you can feel it, then I'll give him a one. Now, if if I do that and he cries and he's active moving and all kinds of things um, going on, that's good, I give him a two. Okay, so you can see what we're coming up with. And then color. Now this baby is blue or pale. Um, is a zero. And then if the body is pink and the extremities are blue, that's okay, but they get a one. That's called acrocyanosis. That's a term that you'll need to remember, acrocyanosis. And then you have where he's completely pink. Okay, usually about five minutes of birth, these healthy babies, they have now been able to get the blood now to the extremities. And so now they're all pink. So they get a big two. So that's how, you know, it goes. Again, we're going to do it at one minute, five minutes, 10 minutes, and 15. Now, again, the five minutes is low, and we've got a baby that maybe has a heart rate, but it's, it's, it's slow. Uh, he's got a slow, weak cry. That would be another one. So that'd be two. Minimal flexion would be three. And minimal response would be four. Usually these babies have no color to them. So he would get a four. He would be, uh, we'd be doing a 10 minute app on this baby. And the baby would probably be in the NICU because there's something going on. So that's why we um, do um, these app bar is to know what kind of uh, resuscitation that we need to do. Okay. Now, a lot of times years ago, um, people thought the app bar score was like a, a predictor of future intelligence or abilities, but it's not. And that's why I always told my patient, no, no, no. It's just how this baby is adapting to extra uterine life. And so then we, we resuscitate according to what we need. Okay. All right. So, you know, if you've got a score of say, okay, so here we go. The nurse assigns the first APGAR score assessment. All right. And you get a score of six following an infant's birth. So which, which is the nurse's next priority? Okay. So you figure a six. And so what do you have to do? Yeah, I want to provide gentle stimulation. It's not too bad. Okay. And maybe just needs to cry a little bit more. Okay. All right, so we're going to give a couple of medications to this little guy. And the first one is the eye medication. And we're going to do that in a ribbon fashion and go on the lower conjunctiva and go ahead and put his eye ointment in it. That's to prevent any kind of eye infection caused by gonorrhea. Okay. And um, again, it's in a ribbon fashion. What I mean by ribbon fashion, it means you come, you put it on and then you come back. Back, back halfway, come forward, back halfway, come forward. And that's called a ribbon fashion. I've seen that on HESI. That's why I'm, I'm, I'm telling you that. And then the other one is vitamin K. And they need that vitamin K um, for assisting in blood clotting, okay? Um, it usually takes about seven days for them to start producing their own clotting. So um, they usually give them vitamin K. All right, and of course, on any any infant, oh, referring to the eye drops, um, there is a skill on page 160, and it goes over um, the skill of putting an eye ointment in. And maybe you could do that in your lab class, um, practice that. Okay, 
And then on page 161 it has about the um, administration of um, the vitamin K. And so it does tell you that it's a small needle. Um, and uh, you always put on you always put on your gloves, and you're gonna go for the vastus um, lateris muscle, and that's right on page one sixty one, everybody. So you can practice that in the lab also. Alrighty, so now you have the vitamin K, and you have the eye ointment in, and what you're always doing is you're um, observing for major anomalies. Okay, um, you want to look at the head to see if there's any head trauma from a delivery. Remember, if they had forceps, they're gonna have some marks on their head. If they had vacuum extractor, remember, it's a circular um, you know, cone that goes on that. Remember, I, we talked about that, I think, on the other day. And it's a circular, and you have to see if there's any marks from that too. Um, and then symmetry. Equality of extremities, make, make, make sure that the extremities are what? Even, okay? What's on the right side should be on the left side. When you stand a baby up, you know, the gluteal folds need to be even and, and not, not even. They want, we want to be even. When they're not e even, excuse me, when they're not even, that is hip dysplasia. And that can happen in utero. So we want to go ahead and, and look at all these. And, um, the digits of the hands and feet, and it could be there's sometimes we have an extra digit and sometimes there's some webbing, um, things that didn't um, just get developed right in utero. So, we're always, so that's part of the assessment of this baby. And then you have some umbilical cord banking. Um, you, it comes right from the umbilical cord and those are what we call stem cells. And so this type of blood is really capable of regenerating stem cells are able to replace disease cells. So those stem cells are your original cells. And whenever you put them into a body, you know, somebody has, say, say for instance, knee pain. And so um, if stem cells have been harvested, that person can use that stem cell and put it into that knee and the, and the, and the stem cells will regenerate the old cells that are there. They're the best cells going. Of course, there are original cells. So people do bank for blood. Um, it's not cheap. It's kind of expensive. There's a big old um, core blood banking in Tampa. That's in Florida here. And I'm sure you have, wherever you are, you have a blood bank, um, core blood cord, cord blood banking. And um, it, it's 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 um, really up and coming thing, okay? So you would have to see what's ever in your area for that. Alrighty. So that concludes um, this review today on this chapter. And so that is chapter six. And please, please, please um, always look at the back of the chapter for your um, key points. And then you have the um on um, the the un evolving the or I should say the evolving um case study. See if you can answer those questions on the back of the chapter. If you cannot answer those questions, then you need to go back into the chapter and you need to review those concepts. Okay, so I'm going to conclude today. You have everybody. I want to say goodbye now.